This Fleet Equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit Hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment, and welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. Today, we're talking with Brad Rosen, Chief Operating Officer of Nodar. Brad, it's great to connect with you. Awesome to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, so you're working a lot in the automated truck space. Uh, Nodar is a new name to me. So uh, why don't you just give us a little bit of, of foundational work here, right? Setting the stage, we see level two automated trucks on the road today. We got some active steering assist. We have the AMTs with the adaptive crews they, that, that yeah. control the, the lateral motions there too. Uh, so the industry has been talking for some while about go getting to level four, right? A lot of people are jumping this level three, which is kind of this half foot in, half foot out of the of the automated world, jumping the level four, which is full machine uh, control. From your point of view, what where is that in development right now is kind of an industry level? What are you working on? And, wh and what are some of the big technical hurdles that we're approaching today to try to get to that automated level? Since the, the DARPA Grand Challenge, people have realized that we can get 3D data, you know, and um, uh, we can do that with a number of, of modalities. And um, the industry initially thought, hey, well, we could just apply, like, for instance, LiDAR to this space and we'll have unmanned driving very quickly. What obviously we've learned is that it's an incredibly complex task to, 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 to handle not only kind of the roads as they're designed today, but human drivers who make mistakes and right. um, an incredibly dynamic environment. So, you know, I think there's been a reset. I mean, it's clearly been a reset and people are saying, hey, well, let's take baby steps. And, you know, that's why we're seeing the ADAS systems that have like level two, auto following, lane keep assist, these types of right. things. Now we're starting to see like in Germany and Japan, you know, some, some uh, limited kind of Un unmanned or self self driving vehicles in like um, low speed on the highway, a very constrained environment, which is great. And the truth of the matter is, like, even with these uh, more rudimentary systems, we're seeing incredible life savings and a reduction in um, in in accidents. And 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 this has been realized not only in passenger vehicles but in the trucking space. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, so what, what we're doing at Nodar is, you know, um, my co-founder spent 13 years building LIDARs at Lincoln Labs, right? LIDAR uses a pulse of light to go out, bounce off something, come back, and, and it measures the time that photon takes to return. And that, that time is proportional to the distance because it travels at the speed of light. Um, okay. There's a lot of issues, you know, Measuring things traveling at the speed of light is really, really hard and requires gigahertz electronics and is, you know, very, very expensive. And, you know, the number of channels, e each uh, laser is considered a channel. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying because there are different types, but basically you have to have a complete circuit for, for each laser, okay. for each channel. And, as a, and, and the laser basically scans. It scans the scene. And so... Um, the cost of those circuits, the fact that it takes a long time to scan the scene, the fact that it's a discrete number of channels, which is very low as compared to, for instance, your monitor that you're looking at right now, which has millions of pixels, right? right. It's okay. emitting photons. So your monitor doesn't have to receive photons. It's just emitting them uh, to you. And um, so um, the way cameras work, we chose a, an approach that uses cameras, right? Because cameras are incredibly high resolution these days and incredibly because of the cell phone and, yep. and you know um just the there are, there are billions of cameras shipped every day every year and they're in the tens of dollars now effectively yep. for the core components um these things have millions of pixels so we said hey and and they're they're solid state right so they're not moving anything that moves causes problems like your average LIDAR, LIDAR works for 7,000 hours and then goes kaput. So that's another issue altogether. Uh, right? It's susceptible to vibration, it breaks, it has a certain number of spins like the mean time before failure is low. So LIDAR is expensive, low resolution and brittle, but it's reliable, right? And it's especially reliable at night. So um, at Twitter, what we're doing, 
so then there's then there's the category of cameras, right? And Tesla uses right. cameras, and Musk is quite outspoken about you know that they don't need radar and other sensors. Right. You know that's a different discussion than what we're having today. But um, he basically agrees. You know, cameras are amazing and incredibly high photosensitivity, and can be used in many different environments and are quite reliable. And he's applying AI or neural networks to deduce uh, what's going on in the scene. Basically, right. that's how Tesla right. works. Single camera, look at the environment, maybe look at multiple frames, deduce what, what's in the scene and how far they might be away. Right. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting technique. And if you've driven a Tesla, you'll find it works really, really well um, for mainstream kind of like everyday driving. 99% of the cases perhaps, or maybe a little bit less. The, the problem is, you know, as a driver, you know, driving is really complex and there could be a hazard zone. There could be someone who fell off their bike in front of you or uh, a piece of lumber could fall off on the highway. Like there are tens of thousands of, you know, road debris found on the highway every year that that can cause accidents. Right. right. So um, what we this is a long, long way of backing into what we're no, I'm, I'm with you. I do. I will back up in a minute, but go ahead and. OK. All it. right. As long as I'm not, you know, well, I'm with you. waxing poetic. <laughs> we're using multiple cameras. We use two or we could use more cameras and we use an age old technique um, called uh, stereo vision or uh, disparity. We, we measure the difference between the two cameras. Like if you close your eyes and you open one and then you open the other, you'll see yeah. a shift in the scene, right? Left to right yes. or right to the left. And that shift is um, you can do geometry basically to calculate precisely the distance to each thing in the scene you're seeing. Okay. So, um, that's what we do. And it's been done for quite a long time. Actually, there have been stereo vision cameras since the late 1800s that it, that kind of, uh, took 3d pictures. Yep. Um, uh, and actually the Subaru has shipped millions and millions of units. They're kind of famous for their stereo vision system it, and, um, uh, all Subaru since 2016 have had a stereo vision system. The differences, and this is like really important and, and why we're sort of disruptive, is that um, because it's a geometric calculation, the relative pose or orientation between the cameras is super important. If you're off by even a hundredth of a degree, the distance calculation is all wrong, right? So. Traditionally, these systems have had the cameras very close to one another and bound by a very stiff beam or piece of metal so that cameras couldn't move at all. Um, and the problem is, you know, the, the, the wider apart you make that, the longer the beam, the more massive that metal has to be to keep them aligned or there's like vibration and movement, right? So, and the last key piece before I describe our solution is, is that, um, the range you can see or the accuracy with which you can see things at range is proportional to the distance between the cameras. So you can imagine if you took your eyes way apart, you would have amazing depth perception. It's directly proportional. So if you put your eyes out by a factor of 10, you could estimate depth, depth 10 times as far as you could today. And this, okay. is we, this is, you know, why we call our product hammerhead, right? Because the hammerhead shark has <laughs> eyes that are super far apart, largest in the, in the animal kingdom. Right. And they actually have incredible depth perception. That's been proven by scientists, oceanographers, whatever. Um, so our, our thing is we do, we do calibration in software, right? We independently mount the cameras. We don't worry about the stiff beam. We can mount them on the roof behind the windshield. In the headlights or the rear view mirrors, the wider, the better. And that allows us to see we've taken super accurate measurements up to 1200 meters. Okay. And the reason this is important, just coming back to trucking specifically, is, is that um, trucks are like 80,000 pounds. They take a long time. They take like 10 seconds to switch lanes. They, they can take 350 meters to stop, you know, I mean, they can typically stop shorter than 350, but like having having the the distance to an object right. 350 meters gives it enough time to make a decision. So we're placing um, cameras very wide apart, either on the roof 
of the truck or embedded in the mirrors. And we're seeing out to a thousand meters with like 0.1% accuracy. So super accurate. Uh, and, and, and so kind of our thing is small objects at long range, which enable highway driving at highway speeds. Right. And, and this ends up being really, really important in the equation to get trucks on the road without drivers. So I wanted to back up for a second. Um, cameras definitely, I mean, it's a big topic in the industry right now, but just going back, uh, your explanation on LIDAR was really excellent. I never really understood how it worked until your explanation, but we, we, you know, for our audience and I'll see, I think I have some archive footage I can dig up for it. You see these like pin pricks, right? Like if there were one in my office, you'd see me sitting in my chair, gesturing wildly, you'd see the computer, you'd see the microphone and that's how you get that data. But the interesting point, uh, uh that you were making there of just how much power and, and I guess preciseness you would need for all those all those beams of light. Super interesting on the camera side. Then too, backing up just so we're all on the same uh, same page here with the audience as well. Right now, level two is combining radar, right? So just standard radar, which has been uh, doing the adaptive cruise and automatic uh, brake assist for a while now, plus cameras, right? So on the truck side, OEMs are are integrating those two things: the the camera visibility, the radar kind of length detection and now what you're describing here is using these cameras to kind of triangulate right or i mean a geom I, I was never very good at geometry that's why i ended up as an editor but try you know to get a picture here how are you uh and that makes sense how are you then building your your ai algorithms then to identify what they're seeing i mean you, you named a couple of things here it could be a pedestrian it could be some other debris it could be another vehicle what, how big of the challenge is getting that identification correct and, and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so a really important point is that the most important thing is that we identify that there's, there's something in front of us that sits above the ground plane. And, and it might be a car, which is very easy to identify or another truck, you know, usually it will be something like that. Um, and those you can apply typical neural networks and, you know, we, we benefit from having, you know, right now we're doing, we have two, five megapixel cameras. So we've got, you know, you know, say we're running at, uh, 10 frames per second, five megapixels per frame. You, you know, that is a heap of data, um, uh, that, that we're able to, that we're, that we're able to pick up. Um, the, the problem is that what if it's an object we haven't seen and, and sadly, like we've seen a bunch of Tesla crashes because uh, the scenes are too complex and perhaps they didn't like identify uh, uh, obstacles properly. Right. So, right. Um, so the key is to identify what, what's the ground plane and is there something sitting above it? So we are very focused on that problem. If we can put a box around, you know, some object, we may not know what it is, but it's in the way um, that's like a huge barrier to adopt to like deployment of these vehicles. The next thing is, okay, what is it? Right. And you can imagine with all our data, we can throw, throw our data into a neural network and we could do a really great job of 3d classification of objects. So, you know, these are all topics for us, right? But the first and most important thing is, is there something 200 meters out sitting above the ground plane that the truck should not drive into. And uh, we're the only ones who can do that. We we're the only ones who can do it between 150 meters and 1000 meters. Because um, LIDAR has the resolution of LIDAR is too low. So let's say there's a motorcyclist lying on the ground at 250 meters. They're they're sitting maybe 20 centi 20 centimeters above the ground, 40, whatever. Um, a LIDAR is throwing out points at that distance. You can imagine, you know, photons go like that. It's unlikely it's going to get any points on that motorcyclist. But even if it just gets one, that's insufficient, right? And also the LIDAR photons bounce off the road. And if they hit the road, they don't come back, right? That's called the glancing angle. So at long distances, the road is not sending any, any photons back for a LIDAR. So a LIDAR cannot detect the ground plane at greater than 150 meters. Um, a monocular system, which uses like Tesla, uses a single camera and applies whatever, 
algorithms to identify objects and say, oh, I know that's a car there and it's taking up this much of my view. Therefore, it must be, you know, 75 meters out. Um, that's those systems will fail at greater than 100 meters. They just won't work. There's just not enough pixels to say, hey, that's a fallen motorist at, at 250 meters. Okay. There's not enough okay. pixels to do that. But for us, we, we accurately detect the ground plane and we and we're taking physical measurements so we know there's something sitting above the ground plane and even at 250 meters we probably have 100 points on it right because okay. we're just measuring photons coming into our sensor right you're not sending them out so and, and then and, and when you say measuring the ground plane i'm glad you gave the example of like let's say you know someone an injured person like laying on the ground because the car makes sense vehicle makes sense it's a good yeah. You, you get the bumper, you get the tires, you get a good but clearance, but even down to that minute level right. of someone just laying on the ground, that is calcul you can calculate that. And you can imagine that um, while it's really, really important to know all the traffic around us and that that's a truck and that's a car and that's a pedestrian, um, the edge cases are where this industry is going to be made or broken, right? Like if a truck goes and drives over a motorcyclist, it's game over. Um, and and yeah. this ties into some of your other question, like what should fleet managers be worried about? Well, if I were a fleet manager, I'd be thinking a lot about liability and safety. Um, and I'd be measuring that with ROI, which like in the trucking industry in particular, the ROI is there. It's there for autonomy in a big way. Uh, I mean, do you see that holistically or are you talking cameras only? Because you mentioned LiDAR is still very expensive too and you're not getting that, whereas the camera proposition is a lot cheaper because they are more ubiquitous and there are a lot of them are already on the trucks and they're just going to be on the trucks uh, yeah. more often than not now. But do you see it just kind of as a technology segment uh, in terms of the liability and the protection there when it comes to market? I mean, are you what's what's your ROI outlook on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is the this is the beautiful conversation, especially around trucking. It's just so crystal clear. First of all, um, these platforms are extre extremely expensive, right? So adding another sensor is, to add safety is not um, it's not a, a big, as big a deal as it is in the cost um, sensitive passenger vehicle market, right? So yeah. when we talk about passenger vehicles like L three, we think that it can be done just with cameras and radar. Um, or just cameras, you know, we don't, we don't take a stance on that. But for unsupervised driving, like L4, robo taxis and trucking, we think it's a sensor fusion situation. So let's take the best sensors, understand their failure modes, fuse them together to make sure we have a high percentage of uh, confidence in what we're seeing. So in our case, we know that cameras have some failure modes, right? Like if there's high glare coming into the camera, it can be, you know, blinded. Um, it, at night, we rely on photons. So we rely on headlights or illumination or lamps, other, other drivers' headlights. But if it's pitch black, we're not getting enough photons, right? And uh, cameras are super sensitive, but not that sensitive. Right. So um, we, we at Nodar have a technology which we patented, which, which is, which is called, you know, sort of a confidence map. And what that does is it says for each pixel, here's how confident we are in the range estimate for that pixel in the scene. And it's pretty cool when you see the whole map of confidence values, you can say, okay, uh, we, th we think there's an object here, but we have lower confidence. We, we can fail over to a LIDAR and we can even tell it exactly where to look. Right. Right, so right. so it's right. the sensor fusion we think that comes that gets L four trucks on the road. So as far as you mapped out how the how the camera sees, I know we're talking a lot about forward looking, but do you have to see around the truck, beside the truck, behind the truck? What's the camera situation there? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's a wonderful question, especially because um, we're we're told that the bulk of uh, fatal accidents with trucks occur on merging. Right. Right, so that notion of being able to see backwards to the side, see vulnerable road users, an oncoming motorcycle. Like I said, the truck takes 10 seconds to switch lanes, so you have to know you have that time. So we did something super cool. We outfitted a truck with cameras, not horizontally, but vertically on either side. We put a bars on either side of the truck, oh, yeah, okay. camera oriented, cameras oriented vertically. And what's cool about 
our technology and, and, and binocular vision in general is that all you need is an overlapping field of view. Like each camera has a V field of view coming out of it. Wherever those cameras overlap in their fields of view is where we can extract depth information. Interesting. Simple geometry again. And so whether we put them vertically or horizontally, it doesn't matter to us. Uh, and so we, we, we've done some really, really cool testing. We've been able to um, detect oncoming vehicles uh, up to 350 meters away with super high accuracy. And it right. gives the truck enough time to uh, shift lanes. Right. Well, and it just makes sense, too, I guess, because if you, I mean, it, the, the camera systems and self-driving systems should be able to see more than I can see as a driver. I mean, I've got massive blind spots. Let's yeah. put a camera there and get rid of the, some of these. Yeah, things, we put, you know? cameras are cheap. We can put this in lots of places. Very interesting. Yeah. Going back really just kind of quickly as an aside, because you mentioned it earlier that when this comes to the market, uh, it, it, there's this interest in dichotomy because it's not really if the truck has an issue it's when a truck has an issue because it's going to happen i mean we've already, as you've noted we've already seen it on the passenger side with tesla uh and it's going to happen but going back to the whole the the larger p- picture of risk and liability and understanding that i mean no accident is ever a good accident but how many in the in the size of the pie of the whole how many more can you reduce by implementing this versus how many incidents have do people have constantly? I mean, you yeah. know, we give so much more uh, leeway or understanding or empathy to a person rather than technology. The technology, we have no, we, we have, it has to be 100% correct 100% right. of the time. And right. so, and even you bringing in the transparency and what you're seeing, I think speaks to that too of like, look, this is what we can see. This is how we're doing it. This is how, how we're depending on that. And, and I, I don't know when you're, when you're talking with, uh, commercial uh, vehicle operators out there in the market. I mean, do, how do they approach it? Do they understand that, or or do they also have that same kind of a? Uh, I'll, I'll give my drivers more more of an empathetic view than than the technology. Does that exist in the commercial world when, from you, your seat? Uh, uh, the technology is never going to get a more empathetic view. You know, everybody's everybody's is is reaching for you know uh, no no fatal accidents in a million miles is kind of a. Is kind of right. a trick, right? But um, you know, <laughs> prior to ADAS systems on trucks, there were many, many, many fatal, fatal right. crashes. The ADAS systems, even the level two ones, have dramatically reduced the number right. of crashes. And so, you know, I think we can all see kind of the evolution. Um, uh, but I, I think we're going to be held to a very, very high standard. Right. And, and like today, unfortunately, there are, there are these fatal Tesla crashes and, um, you know, there are lots of metrics. One metric is just how many accidents are there in this particular type of vehicle per X number of people. The next is how many deaths. Right. Right. And so I think Tesla's very high on the death metric and very, very good on the overall safety metric. Right. Right. So. Anyway, it's a long way of saying, like, I, I think we're going to be held to a very high standard, which is why our technology is super important, right? Like, I, I think any, any deaths are going to um, lengthen the time to market. Right. right. Well, and I mean, even in the commercial side where we've seen on the litigation, right? Where, yeah. I mean, you know, in the truck market, the automotive is a little different on the individual. The truck market, there is a big name on the side of that truck and people yeah. see deep pockets and they are not sympathetic toward commercial operators. Commercial operators know it, but if we can, yeah. to your point, prove the safety value of the systems and they're on the trucks. And, you know, I know the whole liability issue some people are working on uh, with uh, insurance companies as to how this shakes out and how we view all this, if you're implementing it and pumping the money into it to get your ROI. But, um, you know, anything we can do to bring those numbers down to your point, the, the existing systems have been dramatically uh, effective. And I think, you know, yeah. many fleets, I, I never get official numbers in terms of build orders and yeah. who has what uh, systems on there. But I mean, even just my own speculation and numbers I hear tossed around into the 70 and 80% yeah. uh, take rate on level two technology right now for on highway operations. So oh, it'll yeah. be I really think the regulatory, I think the regulatory environment is supporting that and, and, and requiring it. And, you know, there, there's a sea change afoot, but this jump to L4 is, you know, it's a big one. And I think it's going to take, you know, we, we see some 
some marketing, you know, stuff out there, like too simple out there with, with an 80 mile unmanned, um, route, you know, which is, which is a step forward, um, mm -hmm. probably more, more marketing than, than, you know, like, um, a, a giant step for mankind, but these, these companies are, are making great, uh, progress. And we, we do expect to be in the 2024 20, timeframe. We expect to be on a production vehicle without a driver. Okay. Okay. But just to like put a stake in the ground. This thing's happening. It's a title. Right. right. No, well, and what's really cool and why I appreciate you taking the time to give us an update here is that even from the industry point of view, I mean, you mentioned too simple and we see these releases of the news that come out of the seas, kind of mile markers on the road tour more yeah. and automated trucks, but it does seem like it has, uh, to your point earlier, just kind of, okay, this is complicated and the technology is evolving. And now maybe we need to work on the people part and the awareness part and understanding what this is and how we do it. Right. Exactly. Everything needs to be elevated. And, and, uh, the regulatory and people part is m more than half the battle probably. Yeah. For yeah. sure. But, uh, sure. you know, all these companies have amazing technologies. It doesn't really matter whether it's Aurora or plus or Daimler torque, you know, like the, these, these companies have brilliant minds working on this stuff and we're super happy to be part of it. It's fun. Very cool. Very cool. Well, this was a load of fun. I appreciate you taking the time to connect and I'm sure I will talk to you again soon as, as these technologies roll even, even larger. Yeah, I'm here. I, I'm happy to always be a resource. Thank you very much for having me.